later tonight at 8 30 we'll show you our latest hotline documentary it's titled born special it's about uh, cerebral palsy so we're doing some great discussion on it just bring you some previews and some perspective on this next They were born children with special needs, children who require love and exceptional care. But that comes at a cost to the families who have to support these. These are parents who have come to the end. There is no help. So they sink, and then that is it. You need to end things. Nobody likes suffering. I will play football. Born Special, showing Monday, 28th January at 8.30 p.m. and Tuesday, 29th January at 6.30 p.m. Hotline is brought to you by... Melko, we're gonna shop. In Africa, there are many children with cerebral palsy. The numbers are not known for certain, but the World Health Organization estimates that it is likely that every one child in every 300 will have it. This is because maternity services are quite often poor and mothers do not get enough care before and during the birth of the baby. Cerebral palsy is caused by abnormal development of the brain or damage to the developing brain that affects the child's ability to control his or her muscles. 55-year-old Comfort Laye lives at Labadi. Comfort is married with three children. Her second child, Michael Ablo, has cerebral palsy. <laughs> The burden of care for children with this kind of disability can sometimes be heavy, heavy as carrying the weight of the world. Lady be a face or boy me, or mammy, or mammy mosquito net. And I'm a corner, or no be some say, I cry any day, and a bed pan, and an agent for no gain, so the oats pan. Mozo, or oats be brave, or fancy, or better, sir. No, they are brave, and no mammy time to follow in the enemy question for you oats, and no catch me say, O be a ban if you ever catch any say, I am quala way no. Say, oh boy, or more, 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 dear, and dear, oh, for oba, also be a woman, see, Nippon is a mom, mammy. Up to now, my friend, I own family, drew on poor. On beside me, sir, call on poor thing. Is there a more moon name me or moon name me a friend now? My dreaming is I was a crown on female life. Ama, oh, be a woman who be a who they say, or a bad luck or a brabun. Unlike other conditions yeah. which require one or two medical professionals to manage, cerebral palsy involves a lot of specialists like ophthalmologists, occupational therapists, speech therapists, orthopedic specialists, among others. According to Professor Beidou, the burden of care imposed on these parents require that they get serious attention by healthcare professionals, especially psychologists. These are parents who have come to the end. There is no help. It has affected them, which we don't appreciate. And so they sink. And then that is it. You need to end things. Nobody likes suffering. Who wants to suffer forever? You want to end suffering if you are very hungry. You solve it by looking for food. So it's the same thing. Why have they come to that end? That is what we should be looking at. If they had clear explanations, a lot of times, believe me, you may not know that they do not 
fully understand even what condition they have. When you just go and say cerebral palsy, it's not an easy thing to even understand. So whether we like it or not, as a country, we would produce children with special needs. I do not think it's fair on parents to, to take that burden on its own. So those are excerpts from our latest hotline documentary titled Born Special. It'll be airing later tonight at 8.30. Make sure you don't miss it. It's a great story, a very compelling story about children with cerebral palsy. Now, usually these children are left to their fate, but some of them are really, really talented. So how do we get parents of these kids to appreciate what their children have? What role can society also play in ensuring these children are well taken care of? Uh, why don't we delve into it? Our guests today are Hannah Awaji and um, Dr. Josephine Ajiman. Hannah is um, with the Special Mothers Project. It's a, a team dedicated to the service of children with cerebral palsy. And uh, Dr. Josephine Ajiman is a specialist pediatrician. And uh, she's got the medical perspective as well to give us a bit of education on the subject. Ladies, how nice to see you both. Good morning. Good morning. Now, like most images that involve children in any sort of uh, difficulty, it's difficult to watch. It's, it's mm -hmm. tough to watch. But what is tough for us to watch for, for 30 minutes is somebody's entire life, you know, their parents, siblings, who who live with, with uh, you know, wonderful, special children like this. And just sometimes it gets overwhelming. But we want to understand this from, from its basic perspective. So I'll start with you, Doc. Explain to us what cerebral palsy is and how it actually occurs. OK. Um, cerebral palsy is um, a group of disorders. It's not one diagnosis. It's a group mm. of disorders that affect development. You can in speak up for us a little bit. Yeah. They, they affect development in movement and posture mm. in those basic areas. They are usually due to something that occurred, an injury to the developing brain, the immature developing brain of a right. child. It could have occurred in utero, that is during pregnancy, up till about three years old. Mm. any injury that occurs, usually they are non-progressive. It's something that happens and then that's it. Right. They are, it's a different from when there are injuries that are progressive, ongoing. For cerebral palsy, it's a, an insult that occurs that is non-progressive and leads to movement and posture development problems. Right. The, even though the injury is non-progressive, over time the, the manifestation in the child might be changing right. with time. So that's a busy thing. So okay. it's motor development and posture development problems. They right. may also have, because something occurs in the brain and the causes are varied, depending on the part of the brain affected, they may also have other problems apart from the motor problem. But the main thing is the motor problem. So right. they may have problems with um, the hearing, problems with um, um, the eyes, the problems with um, uh, seizures, mm. like epilepsy problems, they may have um, the, um, psychological problems, various other problems that mm. they could have along with it. But the main thing is that this child has a problem with development in movement right. and posture. Okay. Uh, it, it appears to me from the, the f and I haven't met many um, people with cerebral palsy, but the few that I have met, it appears to me that very often when, they, when their motor skills are affected or they have perhaps hearing problems and so forth, their cognitive and mental faculties remain completely normal and some of them are actually very, very smart. But it's just difficult to see that because you're distracted by everything else, is that right? So, so is it because there are different centers of the brain that do different things? How come this injury tends to affect just motor skills, but not often, not um, you know their cognitive um, yeah, skills? Yeah, often they are associated with other things. Mm. But um, it, the, those cognitive things depends on the, the type, the type of cerebral palsy. There are right. various types of it. And that has to do with which part of the brain mm. is affected. 
they are the usual ones that um, tend to occur in some areas of the brain that the water sh what we call watershed areas where there's a lot of vascul vasculature that affect that take blood to set right. several part, set up set certain parts of the uh, of the brain when those major areas are affected you mm. tend to have um, certain tracts in the brain that affect most of the structures so for those ones they may have mm. mental retardation it's more common with the ones we call spastic the spastic ones, right? Uh -huh. They, especially when they involves all the limbs, it's more mm. common. But some other types, you don't have the mental retardation. Right. Um, statistically, we know that about thirty to fifty percent may have mental retardation, okay. but most of them. Right. 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 Now, um, Hannah, you 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 are um, in addition to uh, being on the special mothers project, you actually have a daughter who yeah. has um, cerebral. So you watched that clip and you saw uh, some mothers talk about the frustration. The mother actually admitted to, to um, wanting to kill their child, mm. you know, and kill herself just out of the sheer stress of the situation. Mm. I mean, could you relate to that when you heard what she said? I think that every mother who has had a child with cerebral palsy at one point or the other can relate to that. And that kind of stress comes on i always say as a result of what society puts on you and not what the, it's not that the mother doesn't love the child usually the mother will think that out of love out of love that the child don't seem to fit into society and so the best way out is to get the child out um, we've talked about the fact that only about 30 percent of those children get affected in terms of cognition I can talk about my daughter. She is very intelligent. She can relate. She follows conversations, even though she does not speak. You can, she can, you can finish bathing her, and then she will bring you her dress and her shoe and all those things. She's very intelligent, but it's very difficult getting her into school. Even though we have an inclusive education policy, um, you get go to any school, and they will say, "Oh, we can't handle." Because they have lumped all children with special needs into one. There's a difference between a child who has autism and a child with cerebral palsy. Autism may have behavioral issues, and so they could be violent or whatever. Most of the schools, and children with autism most of the time are walking. Mm. So most schools have experienced children with autism who have been violent or something, mm. and so they shun all children with special needs. It makes it difficult for a parent to work. You don't know where to take your child. Mm. Even though the child is supposed to be in society, you are forced to kind of lock your child indoors and do nothing, breathe and leave. How does that? So do we see the parents' side? Society is making it very difficult for the parents to manage those children. Mm. But on the average, many parents really love the children and wish that they have social life. Mm. It's interesting what you say about the fact that the pressure is from, from outside. It's yes. not from your child, it's from, no. from society. No. So what does Special Mothers Project do to combat this pressure? Okay, so I started the Special Mothers Project when my daughter was two. How I, old is she now? She's six. Six. I realized that there were not much conversations about um, cerebral palsy in the media. So the Special Mothers Project is just a media campaign to highlight the issues of families. We use social media and the mainstream media. I work in the media myself, mm. and so I do publish a lot of stories about what parents go through and link it to the absence of policy and even its implementation. Even if we have a policy, for instance, the inclusive education policy, which I keep referring to, nothing seems to work. Mm. Teachers don't understand that policy head teachers don't understand or even know about that policy they just shun you kind of so i try to bring out stories like this for society to become the judge mm -hmm. whether we are doing well mm -hmm. in the lives of these families or not indeed now um doc let me ask you this if, if a family finds that uh, they have to care for somebody with cerebral palsy will health insurance cover uh, you know, th that care? Hmm. 
um, the issue with the cerebral palsy, the various problems that they have makes it more, the various problems they have make it, makes it a multidisciplinary management issue yeah. because you need to deal with there are a lot of problems, like what she's saying, a lot of problems they have with their movement, their posture, they have feeding problems, they may have problems with hearing depending on the kind of issues they have. They may have problems with their eyes. Mm. They may have um, behavioral problems. Some of them do get behavioral problems. There are a lot of issues they have. Some of them, they develop contractures. They may have to go to orthopedics. Yeah. Some of the postures are so terrible. They may need assistance with uh, sleep, how mm. to sleep comfortably. So many things involved. So it involves going to various healthcare mm. professionals yeah. and other issues. So, not all of those things are covered by insurance. Yeah. So physiotherapy, speech therapy, you know, so it makes it a bit it's a quite challenging mm. for them. You know, so something, some of the issues that insurance may cover, like physiotherapy, there are some yeah. places where physiotherapy that insurance covers. Some places you have a lot of NGOs coming up now yeah. that support physiotherapy, that physiotherapy NGOs, so yeah. that helps a lot. Yeah. But it's a very expensive thing for them. They are not able to access a lot of the things, like what she yeah. said, getting into schools, sometimes yeah. even into care places, because the places are understaffed and the, the personnel are not uh, skilled. They are yeah. not trained sufficiently to handle some of the things. Yeah. So they don't get into those areas. So, it's, it's a very, so we need a lot of things happening in the yeah. system to fully manage the children, because they don't just need for them to to optimize their outcome. We need to tackle all the aspects, mm -hmm. you know, comprehensively. Yeah. Yes, and quite early so that they do well. It's interesting that you, you talk about the multifaceted nature mm -hmm. of the care that is required for a, you know a child or a person with cerebral palsy. I, I always thought, and I'm, I'm glad you're here to perhaps educate us. I always thought that what is covered by the NHIS would be based on a, sort of a list of conditions, not necessarily the sort of the treatments. So, um, for example, I have diabetes. So in, in the United Kingdom, the NHS gives me all kinds the of food, care, including a podiatrist care. for my feet and so forth. Now, I don't have to pay the podiatrist, but if somebody else went to a podiatrist that doesn't have diabetes, they would pay. So it is the condition that makes the treatment rather free, than, yeah. rather than the treatments the that are effects. free or, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is it different in our system? Very different. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> yeah, like what you said, in UK and other places, they have that kind of mm. uh, But I think it's about what she's saying, not just education for parents, but system. Right. The system, yes. The mm -hmm. policy makers, a lot of things that need to come up so that a full understanding or what CP is, it, what it is, what it involves, what it does to the kids, to the families, the outcomes that they can have, mm. and be, um, have very good quality of life, and pr make impact in the society. Right. If this is fully appreciated, then it will be possible to get a lot of facilities in place. Mm. There's a lot that is even in the training of personnel. We need a lot of, we don't have enough um, the kind of skilled personnel mm. that can tackle up. Sometimes you see parents wanting to go outside. There are some few of them that require some bit of surgical management. Yes. We're not able to do all of that here, some of the things we can. And some parents wanting to go out. So um, specialist uh, re uh, rehabilitation specialists, mm. uh, speech specialists, we don't have enough of that. And those things are expensive. Um, physiotherapists, we're having more and more now. but. A lot of areas we don't have all the skills, so all those things need to come in. And I think when the understanding comes fully, then it will be easier to tackle, yeah. to pick up and tackle those areas. And it can't be cured, right? Mm. No. Yes, it doesn't have a cure. But mm. with intense, extensive management, the quality of life is markedly improved. Even mm. the ones who are severely affected. Mm. You can do so much for them. It's sometimes amazing, you know, parents, because they carry a lot of load. Some of the parents, like what she said, they are not able to go to work anymore because they need to spend time yeah. with these kids. Some of them get very heavy. They can't carry them anymore and all that. 
but we find that if they are able to be the support of society, sometimes we have stigma and all those things, with the support yes. of society, community support, and they're able to take up these things and access the care they need, you find that there's a lot of encouragement because you need to see improvements yeah. that they didn't think were possible. Mm. I, I, I remember a parent who, the child took a long time before the child could walk. So she was very relieved and very happy that the child could walk. Mm. So for her, that was enough. So going into other little, little care areas that could maximize that child, you know, she didn't, she was just so relieved about just that she could walk. Mm. So it took a lot of things to get her to appreciate that he needed other things, skills to develop occupational therapy that would help him be able to handle things, do things, maybe mm. even possibly write and all that. Mm. So that once those areas are coming up and the child gets those full things, then seeing the kind of things that happen to the child will mm. bring a lot of encouragement to mm. do some of those things for them. Now, uh, my colleague uh, Beryl Ernestina Richter uh, is the producer of this piece. She joins us via Skype. Beryl, good morning. Good morning, Kojo. Now, this is a truly emotional uh, piece of work that you have done. Tell me about how you stumbled across this story. How did you come across it? And how did you find the families that talked to you? Uh, prior to doing this, I had read a lot about and I, Hannah Waji, I contacted her. She's the founder of the special project. So she linked me with her. She linked me with one. Then my interaction with the one she linked me with was able to get other parents of children. Now, tell me, it must have been quite emotional getting to know these parents and the, the stress and the troubles that they go through just looking after their children. What did you come away with? What was the one learning that you came away with after doing this piece? You are right about that. It was emotional during most, during most of the most of the And one thing I picked from all the interviews, these mothers are really going and it's high time to fight, come together to support. You could see friends in them, some of them find the And we have to come and support them. If it's good, we put in place. And it will get it better, correct. But start from somewhere, we can get, we can get somewhere to, that we can create a flight. Mm. Beryl, you've done a great job. Thank you so much. We'll be watching this at 8.30 p.m. tonight. Uh, all the very best. Thank you. Beryl Ernestina Richter is our colleague uh, who produced that particular piece of work, Born Special. Okay. Now, let me ask you, Hannah, I mean, what is it that needs to change? Uh, uh, and, and, my God, what a big question. But let's take it from the perspective of the authorities, government, society, families just okay. from these three perspectives what needs to change okay so the first thing i have recognized um, realized since i started the project is parents involvement involvement in policy formulation right usually they will call doctors physiotherapists whoever to sit down and decide for you but i live every day with my child and so i know what i think will work for my child so in formulating policies, I think that the parent representation is key to whatever this. Otherwise, we will continue talking about them, but it will be in vacuum because we have lost touch with the reality, the parents who are facing it. Um, we talked about the PG, uh, physiotherapists and all those things. I possibly went to physiotherapists like three times, just three times, but my daughter is doing very well because I learned it as a mother mm. and what I've done with the parents group that I have I, I link to many many parents is to teach them to understand what physiotherapy seeks to do and what you can do as a mother you don't the system requires you to pick your child like I live at OEB mm. and you pick your child from OEB to Kolebu for physiotherapy of 30 minutes and come back there is no communication between the healthcare personnel and us so I had to learn 
kind of I, I learned I told people I tell people that I've learned cerebral palsy more than any other subject on this earth. Mm. So I learned speech therapy. I learned physiotherapy. I learned occupational therapy. I do things with my daughter. I try things out as a parent. And what we are doing with the special model is to try to teach the parents to do these things, but also to advocate for a social workforce that understands what these children need and can work in homes. The University of Education is training community-based rehabilitation professionals. Mm. They come out of school, they don't have a job. You offer them a job to work in your home, they think that it is below them because they want to work in a hospital. I think that parents are ready to contribute a bit to facilitate um, workers. Mm. Social workers and all those things can be trained to take on the task. Even the physiotherapists we have, very little uh, pediatric trained physiotherapists. Mm. They used to focus on only stroke patients. So when they are handling a child, you see from the physiotherapist sometimes they get stuck. They don't mm. know what to do with your child. You know, yeah. so I think that involving the parents in everything, everything else, from the stage of diagnosis to whatever, will change a lot. Yeah. The parents are home. I keep saying that schools can pick on these parents as facilitators or volunteers within schools. Maybe one parent with three children, because they know the children already. Mm -hmm. They can get these children. We don't have centers, rehabilitation mm -hmm. centers in Ghana. So this morning, I had to call a rehabilitation person to come and be with my children to move. Mm. I have to employ someone to take care of her for me to be able to work. Mm. We need some of these things. Um, I think that the so Department of Social Welfare uh, should be helped um, to recruit people who can work in communities mm -hmm. and even in the home settings. If there, there is a statistic to know how many, and there are many, many, many people who don't come out to say this. Yeah. But if we get a statistics, we can even match, even within my where I live, I have like 10 parents who I know stay around and call them any time I need to yeah. call them. So some of these things, um, if we get people to train, because the mothers can become resource persons yeah. who train people. They go to school to learn rehabilitation, but some have never seen a child with cerebral palsy mm -hmm. before, mm -hmm. and they come out as rehabilitation professionals. What are they going to do? Yeah. You know, so, I, s I see an opportunity there. Mm -hmm. um, the government really needs to pay attention to this because parents are clearly willing to pay for the service. Yeah. So why, why doesn't government set up these centers, yeah. let parents pay? It's a source of revenue for government, but it also makes sure that these children people are also getting be employed, the professional, actually. yes, and then people get jobs. So yeah. it's a win-win-win-win-win mm. for everybody involved. Uh, I really don't understand but what as would it is now, prevent the, that the from few, happening. The few organizations that all accept your child, mm. for instance, are charging in big time dollars. Yes, if if you don't have afford, money, mm. you can't you can't educate your yeah. child. Yeah. But if we have government um, yes, reviving the rehabilitation centers and all those things, it will go Make a long a way to help Make enhance the lives of families. Right. Doc, um, prejudice, stigma, they are all children of ignorance. So what is that one thing you would educate the public on uh, to combat the, the prejudice and stigma that uh, you know, children and families de um, you know, that have children with cerebral palsy have to face every day? Oftentimes, those, uh, the prejudice, the stigma associated with local beliefs about what the cause is. So it would be very useful to enlighten like what we're doing, mm. the causes. Because sometimes when people are in the dark, they imagine so many things and because of what they imagine and the way they see things then they look at the children some way but if they get to know and understand what exactly the cause is and how sometimes some of those preventable things that can happen and the fact that there's a lot that can be done to improve these children's lives the kind of challenges like what she's saying the parents the families go through the understanding of these things would help to reduce a lot of the prejudice. Mm. And That's very emotion. useful. I, I think I'll give the last word to you, Hannah. Uh, what's that one thing that you would say um, to everybody watching today, whether they have a relative or a family member that has cerebral palsy, or 
they're just learning about it for the first time today. Mm -hmm. What's that one thing you want everybody to go away with today? Okay, so I want to tell Ghanaians that we all have a role to play in the lives of families that are raising these children. The children can have a good future. And I keep pointing to Farida, who we are all proud of as Ghanaians for doing something. She has cerebral palsy. Farida doesn't even walk independently, but she is doing something. So we should give these children a chance um, to live. Indeed. And what a great example, Farida Bidway, mm. is. I want to say a big thank you to both of you. Dr. Josephine Ajiman is a specialist pediatrician, and Hannah Awaji is from the Special Mothers Project. She's also the mother of a six year old, wonderful six year old, who um, is living with cerebral palsy. Thank you both for your time. We appreciate it ever so much. Right, there's even more coming up on the show. Stay right where you are. Quick break. We'll be back. Wow. They were born children with special needs. Children who require love and exceptional care. But that comes at a cost to the families who have to support these. These are parents who have come to the end. There is no help. So they sink, and then that is it. You need to end things. Nobody likes suffering. I'm a football. Born Special, showing Monday, 28th January at 8.30 p.m. and Tuesday, 29th January at 6.30 p.m. great peace and subsequently the great discussion that took place but mm -hmm. we all hope that uh, we take the cues and also we'll make the issues plain as possible uh, empathize as well absolutely uh, this is a reality that most people are living mm -hmm. with but mm -hmm. it could it could happen to you something as simple as a little injury to your child could could result in cerebral palsy so let's get educated and let's just try to understand that these are all people they are in this world to fulfill a divine purpose. So uh, let's all be a part of their success story rather than to bring them down. Well, that'll be it for now. Please make sure that throughout the rest of the day, you are interactive on Facebook, Journeys on TV. We have a Twitter handle at Journeys on TV. Keep watching us not only on myjohnline.com, but also through YouTube, MyJohnline TV. Mm. Now, don't miss Bone Special. It's at 8.30 later tonight. But listen, just stay with the station for the duration. You get all the best news from us. We're back tomorrow with more. Bye-bye.